Hello, welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I'm Tom Verstreet. My wife and I have lived in Flagstaff for about four years, and last year during the pandemic, we were the mystery readers for my granddaughter's first grade class. We liked that so much, we decided to start reading for Goodnight Flagstaff. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.30, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. If you'd like to check out to read along with us at home, it's available on the Hoopla app with your Coconita Library card. Check out one today. Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through stories. Of all, through stories. all ages welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. The last time we read together, Bilbo, Bilbo braved going back to the dragon's lair after some riddles discovered Smog's weakness, but Smog also found out about the dwarves, Lake Town, and the tunnel's entrance. Now they're trapped inside the mountain with only one way out. Chapter 13, Not at Home. In the meanwhile, the dwarves sat in the darkness, and utter silence fell about them. Little they ate and little they spoke. They could not count the passing time, and they scarcely dared to move, for the whisper of their voices echoed and rustled in the tunnel. If they dozed, they woke still to darkness and silence going on unbroken. At last, after days and days of waiting, as it seemed, when they were becoming choked and dazed for want of air, they could not bear it any longer. They would almost have welcomed the sounds from below of the dragon's return. In the silence, they feared some cunning devilry of his, but they could not sit there forever. Thorin spoke. Let us try the door, he said. I must feel the wind on my face soon or die. I think I would rather be smashed by smog in the open than suffocate in here. So several of the dwarves got up and groped back to where the door had been but they found the upper end of the tunnel had been shattered and blocked by broken rock. Neither key nor magic that had once obeyed would ever open that door again. We are trapped, they all groaned. This is the end. We shall die here. But somehow, just when the dwarves were most despairing, Bilbo felt a strange lightening of the heart, as if, the heavy, as if a heavy weight had gone from under his waistcoat. Come, come, he said. While there's life, there's hope, as my father used to say. Third time pays for all. I'm going to go down the tunnel once again. I have been that way twice, when I knew there was a dragon at the other end, so I will risk a third visit when I am no longer sure. Anyway, the only way out is down, and I think this time you had better all come with me. In desperation, they all agreed. And Thorin was the first to go forward by Bilbo's side. Now do be careful, he whispered to the hobbit, and as for as quiet as you can be. There may be no smog at the bottom, but then again there may be. Don't let us take any unnecessary risks. Down, down they went. The dwarves could not, of course, compared with the hobbit, in real stealth. And they made a de great deal of puffing and shuffling, which echoes magnified alarmingly. But though every now and again Bilbo in fear stopped and listened, not a sound stirred below. Near the bottom, as well as he could judge, Bilbo slipped on his ring and went ahead. But he did not need it. The darkness was complete, and they were all invisible, ring or no ring. In fact, so black it was that the hobbit came to an opening unexpectedly, put his hand on air, and stumbled forward, rolling headlong into the hall. There he lay face downwards on the floor and did not dare get up or even hardly breathe, but nothing moved. There was not a gleam of light, unless, as it seemed to him, when at last he slowly raised his head, there was a pale white glint above him far off in the gloom. But certainly 
it was not a spark of dragon fire. Though the worm stench was heavy in this place, and the taste of vapor was on his tongue. At length, Mr. Baggins could hear it no longer, could bear it no longer. Confound you, Smog, you worm, he squeaked aloud. Stop playing hide and seek and give me light, and then eat me if you can catch me. Faint echoes ran around the hall unseen, but there was no answer. Bilbo got up and found that he did not know in what direction to turn. Now I wonder what on earth Smog is playing at, he said. He is not at home today or tonight, whatever it is. I do believe. If Owen and Glowen have not lost their tinder boxes, perhaps we can make a little light and have a look around before the, before the luck turns. Light, he cried. Can anyone make light? The dwarves, of course, were very alarmed when Bilbo fell forward down the step with a bump into the hall, and they sat huddled just where they had where he had left them at the end of the tunnel. Shh, shh they hissed. Then when they heard his voice, and though that helped the hobbit find out where they were, it was some time before he could get anything else out of them. But in the end, when Bilbo actually be began to stamp on the floor and screamed out, Light! At the top of his shrill voice, Thorin gave way, and Owen and Glowen were sent back to their bundles at the top of the tunnel. After a while, a twinkling gleam showed them returning, Owen with a small pine torch alight in his hand, and Glowen with a bundle of others under his arm. Quickly, Bilbo trotted to the door and took the torch. But he could not persuade the other dwarves to light the torches or to come and join him yet. As Thorne carefully explained, Mr. Baggins was still officially their burglar and investigator. If he liked to risk light, then that was his affair. They would wait in the tunnel for his report. So they sat near the door and watched. They saw the little dark shape of the hobbit start across the floor, holding his tiny light aloft. Every now and again, while he was still near enough, they caught a glint and tinkle as he stumbled on some gold th golden thing. The light grew smaller as he wandered away into the vast hall. Then it began to rise and dance into the air. Bilbo was climbing a great mound of treasure. Soon he stood upon the top, and still it went on. Then they saw him halt, stoop for a moment, they, but they did not know the reason. It was the Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain, so Bilbo guessed from Thorne's description, but indeed there could not be two such gems, even so marvelous a ho in, in even so marvelous a hoard, even in all the world. Ever as he climbed, the same white gleam had shone before him and drawn his feet towards it. Slowly it grew into the globe of pallid light. Now, as he came near, it was tinged with a flickering sparkle of many colors at the surface reflected and splintered from the wavering light of his torch. At last he looked down upon it, and he caught his breath. The jewel shone before his feet of its own inner light, and yet cut and fashioned by the dwarves who had dug it from the heart of the mountain long ago, it took all the light that fell upon it and changed it into 10,000 sparks of white radiance shot with glints of rainbow. Suddenly, Bilbo's arm went toward it, drawn by its enchantment. His small hand would not close about it, for it was large and it was a large and heavy gem. But he lifted it, shut his eyes, and put it in his deepest pocket. Suddenly, Bilbo's arm went towards it. No, oh, sorry. Now I am the burglar indeed, he thought. But I suppose I must tell the dwarves about it sometime. They did say I could pick and choose my own share. And I think I would choose this if they took all the rest. All the same, he had an uncomfortable feeling that the picking and choosing had not really been meant to include this marvelous gem and that trouble would yet come of it. Now he went on again. Down the other side of the great mound he climbed and the spark of his torch vanished from the sight of the watching dwarves. But soon they saw it far away in the distance again. Bilbo was crossing the floor of the hall. 
He went on until he came to the great doors at the farther side. And a draught of fresh air blew across his face, but it almost puffed out his light. He peeped timidly through and caught a glimpse of the great passages and the dim beginnings of wide stairs going up into the gloom. And still there was no sight nor sound of smog. He was just going to turn and go back when a black shape swooped at him and brushed his face. He squeaked and started, stumbled backwards and fell. His torch dropped head downwards and went out. Only a bat, I suppose, and hope, he said miserably. But now what am I to do? Which is east, south, north, or west? Thorin, Balin, Owen, Glowen, Philly, Killy, he cried as loud as he could. It seemed a thin little noise in the wide blackness. The light's gone out. Someone come and find me and help me. For a moment, his courage had failed altogether. Faintly, the dwarves heard his small cries, though the only word they could catch was, Help! Now what on earth or under it has happened, said Thorne. Certainly not the dragon, or he would not go on squeaking. They waited a moment or two. Still, there was no dragon noises, no sound at all, in fact, but Bilbo's distant voice. Come, one of you, get another light or two, Thorne ordered. It seems we may have to go and help our burglar. It is about our turn to help, said Balin, and I am quite willing to go. Anyway, I expect it is safe for the moment. Glowen lit several more torches, and they all crept out one by one and went along the wall as hurriedly as they could. It was not long before they met Bilbo himself coming back towards them. His wits had quickly returned as soon as he saw the twinkling of their lights. Only a bat and a dropped torch, nothing worse, he said in answer to their questions. Though they were much relieved when they, they were inclined to be grumpy at being frightened for nothing. But what they would have said if he had told them at that moment about the Arkenstone, I don't know. The mere fleeting glimpses of the treasure which they had caught as they went along had rekindled all of the fire in their dwarvish hearts. And when the heart of the dwarf, even the most respectable, is wakened by gold and by jewels, he grows suddenly bold and he may become fierce. The dwarves indeed no longer needed any urging. All were now eager to explore the hall while they had a chance, and willing to believe that, for the present, smog was away from home. Each now gripped a lighted torch as they gazed, first at one side and then the other. Then they forgot fear and even caution. They spoke aloud. They cried to one another. They lifted old treasures from the mound or from the wall and held them to the light, caressing and fingering them. Philly and Killy were almost in a merry mood, Finding still hanging, there were many gold harps, strung with silver. They took them and struck them, and being magical, and also untouched by the dragon, who had small interest in music, they were still in tune. The dark hall was filled with a melody that had long been silent. But most of the dwarves were more practical. They gathered gems and stuffed their pockets, and let what they could not carry fall back through their fingers with a sigh. Thorn was not least among these, but he always searched from side to side for something which he could not find. It was the Arkenstone, but he spoke of it not yet to no one. Now the dwarves took down mail and weapons from the walls and armed themselves. Royal indeed did Thorn look, clad in a coat of gold-plated rings with, silver, with a silver hafted axe in a belt of that was crusted with scarlet stones. Mr. Baggins, he cried, here is the first payment of your reward. Cast off your old coat and put on this. With that, he put on Bilbo a small coat of mail wrought for some young elf prince long ago. It was of silver steel, which the elves called mithril, and with it went a belt of pearls and crystals, a light helm, of figured leather strengthened beneath the beneath the hoops with, of steel and studded about the brim with white gems was set upon the hobbit's head. I feel magnificent, he thought, but I expect I look rather absurd. How they would laugh on the hill at home. 
Still, I wish there was a looking glass handy. handy. All the same, Mr. Baggins kept his head more clear of the bewitchment of the horde than the dwarves did. Long before the dwarves were tired of examining the treasures, he became wary of it and sat down on the floor. He began to wonder nervously what the end of it all would be. I would give a good many of these precious goblets, he thought, for a drink of something cheering out of one out of one of Bjorn's wooden bowls. Thorin, he cried aloud, what next? We are armed, but what good has any of the armor ever been before before against smog the dreadful? This treasure is not yet won back. We are not looking for gold yet, but for a way of escape. We have tempted luck too long. You speak the truth, answered Thorn, recovering his wits. Let us go. I will guide you. Not in a thousand years should I forget the way of this palace. Then he haul, hailed the others, and they gathered together, holding the torches above their heads. They passed through the gaping doors, not without many looking back, uh, not without a many backward looking glance of longing. Their glittering mail they had co they had covered again with their gold clo old cloaks and their bright helms with their tattered hoods, and one by one they walked behind Thorin, a line of little lights in the darkness that halted often, listening in fear once more for any rumor of the dragon's coming. Though all the adornments were long moldered or destroyed, and though all was befouled and blasted with the comings and goings of the monster, Thorne knew every passage and every turn. They climbed long stairs, turned and went down wide, echoing ways, turned again and climbed yet more stairs, and yet more stairs again. These were smooth, cut out of the living rock, broad and fair, and up and up the dwarves went, and they met no sign of any living thing, only furtive shadows that led from the that fled from their approach of their torches fluttering in the drafts. The steps were not made all the same, for Hobbit legs and Bilbo was just feeling that he could go on no longer when suddenly the roof sprang high and not far beyond the reach of their torchlight. A white glimmer could be seen coming through the opening far above, and the air smelt sweeter. Before them, the light came dimly through the great doors that hung twisted on their hinges and half burnt. This is the great chamber of Thror, said Thorin, the hall of feasting and of council. Not far off now is the front gate. They passed through the ruined chamber. Tables were rotting there. Chairs and benches were lying there overturned, charred and decaying. Skulls and bones were upon the floor, among the flagons and bowls, broken drinking horns and dust. As they came through yet more doors at the further end, the sound of water fell upon their ears, and the gray light grew suddenly more full. There is the birth of the running river, said Thorn. From here it hastens to the gate. Let us follow it. Out of the dark opening in the wall of rock there issued boiling water, and it flowed swirling in a narrow channel, carved and made straight and deep by cunning ancient hands. Beside it ran a stone-paved road, wide enough for many men abreast. Swiftly along this they ran, and a round, wide, sweeping turn, and behold, before them stood the broad light of day. In front there rose a tall arch, still showing the fragments of old carven work within. Worn and splintered and blackened though it was, the misty sun sent its pale light between the arms of the mountain, and the beams of, and beams of gold fell on the pavement at the threshold. A whirl of bats, frightened from slumber by their smoking torches, flurried over them. As they sprang forward, their feet slithered on stones, rubbed smooth and slimed by the passing of the dragon. Now, before them, the water fell noisily onward and foamed downwards toward the valley. They flung their pale torches to the ground and stood gazing with dazzled eyes. They were come to the front gate, and they were looking out upon the dale. Well, said Bilbo, I never expected to be looking out of this door. 
I never expected to be so pleased to see the sun again and to feel the wind on my face. But oh, the wind is cold. It was. A bitter easterly breeze blew with the threat of oncoming winter. It swirled over and around the arms of the mountain and into the valley and sighed among the rocks. After their long time in the stewing depths of the dragon-haunted caverns, they shivered in the sun. Suddenly, Bilbo realized that he was not only tired, but also very hungry indeed. It seems to be late morning, he said, and so I suppose it is more or less breakfast time. If there is any breakfast to have, but I don't feel that Smog's front doorstep is the safest place for a meal. Do let us go somewhere where we can sit, quiet for a bit. Quite right, said Balin. I think I know which way we should go. We ought to make for the old outlook post on the southwest corner of the mountain. How far is that? asked the hobbit. Five hours march, I should think. It will be, a ru- it will be rough going. The road from the gate is along the edge of the streams seems all broken up. But look down there. The river loops suddenly east across the dale in front of the ruined town. At that point, there was once a bridge leading to the steep stairs that climbed the right bank, and so to the road running towards Raven Hill. There is or was a path that left the road and climbed up to the post. A hard climb, too, even if the old steps are still there. Dear me, grumbled the hobbit. More walking and more climbing without breakfast. And I wonder how many breakfasts and other meals we have missed inside that nasty, clockless, timeless hole. As a matter of fact, two nights and a day between had gone by, and not altogether without food. Since the dragon smashed the magic door, but Bilbo had quite lost count, and it could have been one night or a week of nights for all he could tell. Come, come, said Thorin, laughing. His spirits had begun to rise again, and he rattled the precious stones in his pocket. Don't call my place a nasty hole. Wait till it has been cleaned and redecorated. That won't be till Smog's dead, said Bilbo, glumly. In the meanwhile, where is he? I would give a good breakfast to know. I hope he is not up on the mountain looking down at us. That idea disturbed the dwarfs mightily, and they quickly decided that Bilbo and Balin were right. We must move away from here, said Dory. I feel as if his eyes were on the back of my head. It's a cold, lonesome place, said Bomber. There may be drink, but I see no sign of food. A dragon would always be hungry in such parts. Come on, come on, cried the others. Let's follow Balin's path. Under the rocky wall to the right there was no path. So on they trudged among the stones on the left of the river. And of the emptiness and desolation soon sobered Thorn again. The bridge at Balin that Balin had spoke of, they found long fallen. And most of the stones were now only boulders in the shallow, noisy stream. But they forded the water without much difficulty and found the ancient steps and climbed the high bank. After going a short way, they struck the old road and before long they came to a deep dell sheltered among the rocks. There they rested for a while and had such breakfast as they could, chiefly cram and water. If you want to know what cram is, I can only say I don't know the recipe, but it is biscuitish, keeps good indefinitely, is supposed to be sustaining and is certainly not entertaining, being, in fact, very uninteresting except as a chewing exercise. It was made by the lakemen for long journeys. After that, they went on again, and now the road struck westward and left the river, and the great shoulder of the point of the south-pointing mountain spur drew ever nearer. At length, they reached the hill path. It scrambled steeply up, and they plodded slowly, one behind the other, till at last the late a- in late afternoon they came to the top of the ridge and saw the wintry sun going down towards the west. Here they found a flat pace, place without a wall on three, with a wall on three sides, but back to the north by a rocky face in which there was an opening like a door. From that door there was a wide view east and south and west. Here, said Balin, in the old days we used to keep watchmen, and the door behind leads into a rock-hewn chamber that was made here as a guard room. There were several places like it around the mountain, 
But there seems small there seemed small need for such watching in the days of our prosperity, and the guards were made over comfortable. Perhaps otherwise we might have had longer warnings of the coming of the dragon, and things might have been different. Still, here we can now lie hid and sheltered for a while and can see much without being seen. Not much use if we've been seen coming here, said Dory, who was always looking up towards the mountain's peak, as if he expected smog to be perched there like a bird on a steeple. We must take our chance of that, said Thorin. We can go no further today. Here, here, cried Bilbo and flung himself on the ground. In the rock chamber, there would have been room for a hundred and there was a small chamber further in, more removed from the cold outside. It was quite a, it was quite deserted. Not even a wild animal seemed to have used it in all the days of Smog's dominion. There they had laid their burdens, and some threw themselves down at once and slept. But the others sat near the door and discussed their plans. In all their talk, they came perpetually back to one thing. Where is smog? They looked west and there was nothing, and east and there was nothing, and in the south there was no sign of the dragon. But there was a gathering of many birds. At that they gazed and wondered, but they were no nearer to understanding it when the first cold stars came out. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for chapter 14 of The Hobbit. Good night, Flagstaff.